Well, hello there. I'm Allison Gray, and I'm a musician by the name When Humans Had Wings. My debut album, my baby, Run Rabbit Run, is out now on all streaming platforms, so please go listen to it. Run Rabbit Run features seven songs inspired by the seven dimensions of the mysterious and misunderstood rabbit archetype. So I'm making this video essay as a companion to the album to synthesize for you some of the more complex and confusing aspects of this symbol. It has been a lifelong dream of mine, actually, to be a symbology professor, so thank you for indulging me. So this video is going to be in seven sections, each covering a different aspect of the rabbit archetype, and the corresponding song from my album will be playing during each section. I've got my homemade rabbit ears on for the occasion, and I've got my rabbit sweatshirt on, which you can buy in my merch shop. I'll put the link in the description. Without further ado, let's begin. Rabbits. Rabbits appear in a wide variety of cultural contexts. The rabbit holds the polarity of both innocence, which is knowing nothing, and madness, which is knowing too much. So how did rabbits come to be associated with this paradox? Our first clue lies in the most enduring and recognizable symbol of the rabbit in pop culture, and that is the act of a rabbit being pulled out of a hat by a magician. Though the world of stage magic is currently dominated by atheists who perform these tricks as a challenge to the supernatural, let's not forget that stage magic would not exist if not for its predecessor, actual magic, the occult. You could even say that the stage magician's best kept secret is that magic is real. Herein lies the significance of the classic stage act, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. So the hat is worn on the head, so right away we know it's a symbol of the mind. The fact that you can't see the rabbit in the hat means it's in the subconscious compartment of the mind. And so by taking a rabbit out of the hat and bringing it into the spotlight, the magician is demonstrating that he has mastered control over his mind by bringing the mysterious mechanisms of the subconscious into the light of consciousness. In the occult, this alchemical process of unifying the subconscious mind with the conscious mind is referred to as the great work. Now, although there are very practical reasons why magicians pull rabbits out of hats as opposed to some other animal, the reason that the rabbit out of the hat resonates so strongly in the cultural consciousness to the point where it's now pop culture reference is because in real life, the rabbit actually does embody the journey of the consciousness down into the subconscious mind. Because outside of the stage magic context, in nature, the rabbit actually lives in the underworld. Rabbits, rabbit holes. If you're alive today in this our year 2022, you already know conspiracy theories are a very big thing. Exploration of conspiracies is playfully called going down the rabbit hole. To some, this is a reference to Alice in Wonderland, where Alice follows a white rabbit and finds herself in a world that is increasingly strange and nonsensical. To others, it's a reference to the iconic instruction from The Matrix, follow the white rabbit, which results in Neo learning just how bizarre reality actually is. And if you're someone who's gotten really deep into conspiracy, theories yourself, you know firsthand just how strange and warped reality starts to feel the more that you explore this topic. And although I do personally enjoy some rabbit hole diving and believe in some conspiracy theories myself, not everyone has the mental fortitude to repeatedly dive down into the darkness of the rabbit hole and return to the light of the overworld with their mental health intact. Madness is real and it can be a consequence of taking these frequent underworld journeys without first properly preparing and protecting one's psyche. Indeed, the madness aspect of the rabbit archetype will be fully covered in a later section of this video. For now, let's talk a little bit about what makes the rabbit the perfect candidate for these frequent trips into the darker compartments of the psyche. The rabbit, though she is small, is incredibly powerful.
Enter Jayeshya Nakshatra. In Vedic astrology, Jayeshya is the realm of the sky where the deity Indra lives. Indra is the king of the gods. As king, his mythology is rife with drama after drama, power struggle after power struggle, loss after loss, but also triumph after triumph. Indra is called paranoid, cunning, deceptive, obsessive, narcissistic, manipulative, and a master of the art of war. How is Indra relevant here? Well, in the Yonikuta system, all nakshatras are associated with an animal that is said to represent their sexual energy, which basically means the animal that represents their character, as sexual energy is thought to be the soul essence of a person. And Jayeshja's yoni animal is the rabbit. So for this reason, I'll be using actual Jayeshja and Anuradha natives to illustrate rabbit energy embodied in human form. So full disclosure, I am a Jayeshya ascendant, and as a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons I first started believing in astrology. Before I knew anything about Vedic astrology and the fact that astrologically I am a rabbit, um, rabbits were always very important to me. A uh, rabbit character featured very prominently in my book, The Unlimits, this dance by Wade Robson on So You Think You Can Dance called Homage to the Rabbits has always been my favorite choreography. I've watched it like a thousand times. And I was actually cast as a rabbit in a college play that I can't tell you the name of because apparently we were not supposed to be performing that play. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't my choice, I didn't know. So before we go any further, I wanna show you just how much Jayeshas and Anuradhas embody rabbit energy by showing you how we look alike. So here's a picture of a rabbit, and here are some people with Jayeshja in their sun, moon, or ascendant. Notice how, just like a rabbit, the nose kind of goes forward and then slopes inward and the jaw is kind of small and a bit receded, a lot like the shape of a rabbit's muzzle. Also notice, in a lot of cases, the front teeth of a Jayeshta or Anurata are prominent or kind of buck tooth. That is definitely true for me. You can't really tell. Yeah, but my two front teeth are actually pretty prominent. I've also noticed, especially in females of these nakshatras, that the hips are very wide. In fact, many Jayeshja female celebrities are known for flaunting their hips and buttocks in their work. And my nickname in high school was actually Hips. So if that tells you anything, we'll get into why that is. You know, what it means for uh, a zodiac sign to occupy a certain body part later in the video. Interesting to note about Gabby Hanna, um, she has this rabbit tattoo which she drew herself and the rabbit's head is springing off of its body which like says it all really. And mentioned before, the Matrix, one of the Wachowskis, I believe it's Lily, um, is a Jayeshta moon. And so consider how interesting it is that one of the most iconic references to rabbits in movie history, Follow the White Rabbit, was a line written by a Jayeshta native who is a rabbit embodied. I just think that's so interesting. So now that you know how rabbit people look, literally like rabbits, let's talk about the character of rabbit people. Starting with this question, how did Indra, the king of the gods, come to be associated with this ball of fluff? <laughs> well, think about it. If you were a prey animal, wouldn't you also be terribly concerned with power? Let's not forget, in the myths, Indra is said to be covered in 1,000 yonis. Yes, that's 1,000 vaginas, which are later turned into 1,000 eyes, with which Indra can see all around him at all times. So let's pause and reflect on what it means to be covered in 1,000 receptive organs. Imagine that was you. Wouldn't you feel incredibly sensitive and vulnerable? I mean, you could potentially be penetrated at any angle at any moment. How would you protect yourself? This symbolism in Indra's mythology points us to a truth about Jayeshja natives, and that is that they feel overexposed, too seen and too known. Like a rabbit who must be very wary of how she navigates the overworld, which is where hunters and predators lurk, 
so too must the Jayashta native be extremely strategic in how they present themselves in the public eye, lest they find themselves preyed upon by bigger and faster and stronger opponents, or God forbid, gossiped about. <laughs> there are so many examples of Jayashta natives elaborately responding to their haters explaining themselves constantly and defending themselves against criticism, even perceived criticism or disrespect. There are entire compilations of Donald Trump walking out of interviews when he doesn't like how they're going. Gabby Hanna famously makes hours long responses to her haters. Fuck you, fuck all of these people for what they've done to me. And for them to be tweeting right now, I'm playing the victim. I am the fucking victim. If you even subconsciously disrespect the Jayeshta, they'll notice. Nothing gets past you when you're covered in a thousand eyes. So if I turn up to a photo shoot and you had and you got a fifty dollar clothes budget and some sliced pickles on court, you want to know what? No, I am gonna leave. Is that wrong for? Wanting more for myself? Wanting people to treat me with respect? Say that if you had a business day. that you were passionate about, then you would know what it takes to run a business, but you don't. So you don't even act like you know what case. I'm talking about. Thus, power is a central meditation to the life of Jayeshja natives. Indeed, Indra famously wields the lightning bolt which is the most powerful weapon in Hindu mythology and in other symbolic systems. And this fixation, this concern for where they stand in relation to other people leads to another interesting quirk of Jayeshta natives, and that is that they are prone to overcompensation. Jayeshtas really proudly identify with their accomplishments. Hi, uh, what's your name and where are you from? My name is Taylor. I'm from Nashville. All right. Mm. Nashville. Mm. Taylor, what do you do for a living in Nashville? Uh, I'm a singer. <laughs> of course you are. A singer. Whatever. Uh, and uh, I guess if you're a singer and you live in Nashville, you're probably a songwriter too. Yeah, and I have six Grammys too. Uh. And oddly, even Jayeshtas who are not conventionally talented or work in extremely narrow niche fields still manage to find themselves at the tops of their fields. The lines between genuine success and illusory success get really blurry with Jayeshtas. Sometimes all it takes is for a Jayeshta to walk into a room like they own the place, and then the next thing you know, they do own the place. Take, for example, Charlie Sheen. Not the greatest actor who ever lived, but somehow he's the highest paid. And Donald Trump, who never had a political career before becoming actual president of the United States for four years, ironically infamous for his ungovernable behavior. And both of these Jayeshta men have something very interesting in common, which I think is to be credited for their polarizing success. No matter how badly they're actually doing in life, they are unwaveringly committed to the claim that they are winning. This Charlie Sheen interview is just fucking legendary, full of Jayeshja and Indra themes, so please watch it. Doctor of? What are Some you are saying that of? you're bipolar. Wow, what does that mean? <laughs> I guess that, you know, you're on two ends of the spectrum. Wow, and then what? What's the cure? Medicine? Make me like them? Not gonna happen. I'm by winning. I win here and I win there. Now what? If I'm bipolar, aren't there moments where a guy like crashes in like in the corner, like, oh my god, it's all my mom's fault? Shut up. Shut up. Stop. Move forward. Have you had any celebrities reach out to you to oh, try yeah. and help you? Yeah, yeah. Like radical people like Sean Penn and Mel Gibson and Colin Farrell and just radical people. Just to just to see it's oftentimes says unknown, but occasionally, you know, a giant marquee name comes through on your caller ID and it's like, winning. It's almost as if Jayeshja Nakshatra is a celestial portal through which its ruling deity, Indra, can operate here in the physical realm. And we see this embodied in its natives, especially in how the theme of royalty keeps coming up over and over and over again around Jayeshja's. Nicki Minaj is called the queen of rap. Taylor Swift, Queen of Country, Donald Trump, 
president of the United States. How the fuck? Um, Gabby Hanna, her first album is called Trauma Queen. And there are so many other examples I could give you. It's as if Jayesh just on some level know that they're royalty. In order to fully understand why power means so much to the Jayeshtian native, we must talk about the fourth dimension of the rabbit archetype, and that is sexuality. <music> Fucking like rabbits. How could I talk about rabbits and not mention sex? They're well known for their constant and quick fornication, as well as their remarkable multiplication skills. As with all living beings, the rabbit's libido provides direct and clear insight into the nature of the animal and the people who embody its energy. In magic, sexual energy and creative energy are considered essentially the same. So just by observing the rabbit's sexual behavior, we can deduce a few things. Rabbits are highly creative. Rabbits are spontaneous. Rabbits are super charged. Rabbits are free-spirited. It makes sense then that Jayeshta would be ruled by Indra, who wields the lightning bolt. And perhaps this explains why the mascot of Energizer Batteries is the Energizer Bunny. So here's where the connection to sexuality gets like really undeniable. If you ascribe to sidereal calculations, then Jayeshta falls under Scorpio, which is associated with the genitals, the hips, the genitals, like that section of the body. And both sections are associated with the sacral chakra, which is the creative center of the energy body. For a zodiac sign to be associated with a body part is to say that people dwelling in the energy of that sign operate in this realm primarily through that region of the body. And this is clearly observable in a number of Jayeshta natives whose work prominently features their butts. Perhaps the best example of this is Nicki Minaj's Anaconda video, which famously broke the internet. Let's not forget Kim Kardashian, who is famous for her butt. I happen to know that a certain niche erotica writer who is famous for his books about butts um, is a Jayeshta native. And there are, again, many examples of hips and buttocks showing up constantly in the works of rabbit people. This association with the sacral chakra is also observable in the fact that Jayeshta natives are like always making something. I know that that's true for me. At any given moment, I'm working on like five creative projects at a time. I know one Jayeshta guy who claims that he wrote 6,000 words a day. And in fact, he lives full time off of his art. It's true for Francesca Lea Block. It's true for Gabby Hanna. You know, these people who are constantly creating as if they don't have an off switch. Now here comes the paradox. Though our friend the rabbit is associated so strongly with sexuality, there remains the strange fact that rabbits are also thought to be symbols of perpetual innocence. So who is this strange character? who can repeatedly journey into the underworld and come out every time looking just as fluffy and adorable as ever. The rabbit's maintenance of eternal youth is a testament to just how comfortable she is with her vast collection of uncomfortable truths, and also an indicator of her never-ending potential. So it would do us well here to shift over focus from Jayeshtas to their yoni consort, Anurata. Anurata is the other rabbit person in the Vedic astrology Yonikuta system. Unlike Jayeshja, who is fast and finicky and irritable, Anurata is soft and slow and subdued. I kid you not, this meme for me is like the perfect representation of the polarity of Jayeshja and Anurata. So Anurata energy. Um, I had an Honorata ex who spoke very slowly. Her voice was like syrupy. I have a close Honorata friend, same deal, speaks very slowly, and she has this like grounding effect with her voice. My brother is an Honorata, he speaks very slowly, and he learned to speak later in life. In fact, they were wondering if he had like a speech defect or something. My niece, Honorata Moon, same deal. She didn't learn to talk until very late. And so I think it's so interesting, this recurring theme of slow speech in honoratas, especially in contrast to the like 
crackhead energy of Jayesha's, who speaks so fast. No offense to anybody, I'm allowed to say that because I'm a Jayesha. So this right away provides some key insight into why Jayesha and Anurata are star-crossed lovers. As with all Yoni consort couples, the two nakshatras embody seemingly opposite energies that at the core are actually the same energy. I would say both Anurata and Jayeshja share a strong sense of honor and a profound passion for life and the things and the people that they love. Whereas Jayeshja's sense of honor manifests as a desire to win at all costs, uh, proving her worth by taking action constantly and overcoming perils at every turn, Anurata's sense of honor manifests as a deep devotion to love. So Anurata is content to just be and just be still, providing that counterbalance energetically to Jayesha's constant motion. Where Jayesha is paranoid, Anurata is trusting. Where Jayesha is finicky, Anurata is still. Where Jayesha is aggravated, Anurata is peaceful. An illustrative example of this, my Anurata ex worked as a crisis hotline counselor. So she basically, her job was to talk people out of jumping off of bridges, talk them out of overdosing. Like people would call her with the most panic and fear in their voice. And her job was to slow them down, get them to think straight, and then turn them to the appropriate resources for their particular situation. I had the honor of witnessing one of these calls one day when we were both working from home. And so it was really fascinating to watch how people would call with like racing speech and racing thoughts. And she would just energetically subdue them, even get them to laugh at the situation. She just had that knack. My close honorata friend is a volunteer at a suicide hotline and Given her very calming presence, um, I just think it's so interesting that I know two Anurata people whose literal job is to calm people down when they're in that heightened, frenetic state. I have a great story from my personal life to illustrate the interplay between Anurata and Jayeshta. I was part of an extracurricular program for five years called Young at Arts, which was founded by Sharon Pirtle, who is an Anurata native. The purpose of this program was to provide kids from underserved communities with top quality musical theater training from, I mean, straight up celebrities at times. So we were really privileged to share the stage with some major players in the theater world and sometimes TV stars. And when I was a student of this program, me and the other Jayeshta girl in the program got some of the most prestigious gigs. In fact, we were personally invited to sing for Bob Dole and George McGovern at the 2008 World Food Prize. And to the best of my knowledge, that particular gig, as well as many of the other celebrity connections we were afforded through this program were made possible by Camille Zamora, a Jayeshta native who ran a sister program to Young at Arts called Sing for Hope. So I think it's so illustrative that an Anurata native created this program where she basically just provided the structure and the stage for other people to step onto and shine. And so then Jayeshtas went ahead and filled those roles roles. In short, an honorata provided the foundation that the Jayeshtas could then stand on and receive accolades and success through. And one more very interesting fact about Miss Pirtle, she and her husband had this cute nickname for each other. They called each other Rabbit. Now, I don't know his astrology, but I know that she is an honorata. So this is where I want to talk about the controversy over whether the yoni animal of Jayeshta and honorata is a rabbit or a deer. Um, in my observations, as I've outlined with many examples throughout this documentary, I just keep seeing rabbits everywhere in the personal lives and in the artwork of Jayeshtas and Anuradas. 
and I kid you not, I wish I had gotten this on camera or something. I recently had my four-year-old Honorata Moon niece visiting my house, and she's pretty rambunctious. So me and my aunt were discussing what animal we should compare her to. We were thinking maybe a monkey, maybe a puppy, and we kept like talking out loud trying to find an animal to compare her to. And finally she shouted of her own volition, I'm a rabbit! <laughs> <laughs> and later she told me rabbits are her favorite animal. Again, totally unprovoked. So, like I said, I keep seeing rabbits everywhere in the lives of Jayeshas and Honoratas. I don't see deer coming up. So, I know that like traditionally Vedic astrology posits that we're talking about deer embodied in these natives, but I'm not seeing it in my personal research. If you do have a stunning number of examples of deer coming up in the works and lives of Jayeshtas and Anuradhas, I invite you to make your own video essay providing these examples and I will eat my words. But until then, I will continue to say that they're rabbits embodied until proven otherwise. So I think this reveals why Anurata is such a good fit for Jayeshtya. With constant vigilance, the Jayeshtya demonstrates and signals a deep desire for guardianship. Remember how we spoke earlier about how Jayeshtas are completely vulnerable and covered in receptive organs. Jayeshtya deep down really wants to feel protected. And so Jayeshtya overcompensates by going to battle constantly to kind of like look tougher than they are, but deep down they're like really scared and anxious and just want someone to come and like rescue them. Overwhelmed, overworked, overpaid. I'm on top of the world sitting pretty on a stack, but the static still cracks in my veins. At the bottom of the universe, I'm feeling all the weight. People die for this. People lie for this. People suck and fuck some guy for this. Pay the toll for this. Sell their soul for this. Play my part, but what's my role in this? I'm not built for this. All the guilt of this. And I don't think I can deal with this. I'm too old for this. Gonna fold from this. People starving and I get gold for this? You all chalk me up as some whiny fuck who's stressed by success like my life sucks. I get it. I know. It's such a conundrum. I get what I want, but I can't have much fun with it. It's not the fame or the money I'm yearning I don't give a fuck about what I've been earning But each day I wake up more blessed than I'm learning Of all these people, I'm least to deserve it And this is why Anuradha's gentle nature is a perfect fit for them Anuradha's deep devotion to love creates a grounding space In which Jayeshtha can finally relax And conversely, Jayeshtha draws out Anuradha's secret buried desire for power I've noticed that Anuradha seem to really want to be lit up by somebody. So Anuradha benefits from being partnered with someone who is willing to go to battle for love and defend her softness. Thus, when Jayeshtha demonstrates with the, this propensity for conflict that Jayeshtha will not tolerate disrespect, um, this calms the consciousness of the Anuradha partner who wants to know that her devotion will be met with respect. However, you know, I'm, I'm kind of painting it as like this love story that is infallible, but in reality, you know, Yoni concerts are a really fascinating thing. The reality is that it takes work to balance polarity in a relationship and to appreciate what feels like opposition in your partner. So, and so, you know, going back to Jayeshja being all about power struggle, this can manifest in close relationships too, you know, even Jayeshja's lover is not necessarily safe from Jayeshja's need to like constantly win. So you know, rabbits aren't all that innocent is what I'm saying. As much as rabbit people may strive to create conditions of safety in which to experience love, this begs the question of what safety is exactly. How does one know when they're safe? By seeking out the familiar constantly, are we actually condemning ourselves to greater danger, greater risk, by missing out on what else might be possible? Are we failing to come to terms with the truth of reality, and in doing so, driving ourselves mad? Fun fact about our friend Indra, he is also described as delighting in the consumption of Soma, a hallucinogenic beverage that is said to have enhanced his divine powers. Hallucinogenic, you say? Drug culture and rabbit culture go hand 
in hand. Think of the white rabbit from Alice in Wonderland being synonymous with drug use, thanks to the iconic Jefferson Airplane song. Indeed, drug trips are often described as going down the rabbit hole, much like conspiracy theorizing. Now, while writing this part of the video essay, I had the inkling to look up the charts of a number of thought leaders in the drug world, like the drug subculture. And interestingly, I found that there does appear to be a trend of Jayesh's and Anuradha's dominating discourse on the benefits of drugs, particularly psychedelics and marijuana. I haven't had time to collect a larger sample size in order to verify whether there is an association between rabbit people and drug use or the promotion of drugs, um, but I thought I'd throw that out there and if that sounds interesting to any of you, I invite you to research it further on your own. This is not to say the Jayeshtas are necessarily drug users, but this cultural association between rabbits and drugs is revelatory, because if you listen to drug users describe their trips, whether they're talking about marijuana or crack cocaine or ayahuasca, there is a common thread between all of their accounts, and that is this. Truth is stranger than fiction. Drugs afford people a glimpse into the many permutations of perspective that are not available at a baseline of consciousness. Altered states of consciousness, whether triggered by mystical experiences or by drug use, often result in the experiencer questioning what reality is altogether. Hence, those who have gone down the rabbit hole without first setting a strong intention for why they're going down there are lucky if they ever fully come back to consensus reality. Once the consciousness is altered in a person who lacks psychic fortitude, it's altered for good. And the trickiest thing about this is altered states of consciousness brought on by drugs have a very tricky way of making the experiencer believe that they have stumbled upon a reality that is more real than the reality they were previously experiencing. Or a statement I get a lot is that I am, uh... I am experiencing some sort of uh, fake temporary experience of spirituality or divinity or uh, whatever it is. You're, if you're using a psychedelic to get there, it's not legitimate or it's not, um, it's not real. A lot of people feel this way and um, for me personally this is not something I feel because I and me and I have had these experiences and I know that they have been profoundly impactful in my life and have changed me very deeply and have shown me uh, have given me new eyes new spiritual vision to see the world and to connect with people I see people differently now I see people through more a more compassionate way now, I want to move along to a discussion of madness in relation to rabbits, not necessarily having anything to do with drug use. Coincidentally, while I was editing this video, Gabby Hanna started making headlines for what appears to be a manic episode or a psychotic break that she was having and documenting in real time on TikTok. So I'm going to show you some of that. You know, every time I say I'm going to save the world, people laugh at me but they tell us you can be anything you want and that we have this unending power that we don't know and that we can channel the holy spirit and do whatever we want manifest write it down you can have anything you can be the president of the united states but why doesn't everybody else together like me with me every single day manifest saving the world because if all of us were delusional enough that we could be the person to save the world and then we can we have to save ourselves to save each other and how are we saving ourselves if we don't believe in ourselves and the power that god gave us Instead of laughing, why don't you pray with me? Why don't you encourage me? <laughs> Everyone. Most people are commenting on the Gabby Hanna situation as if it's a clear demonstration of what mania looks like, of what psychosis looks like. However, 
I'm gonna be the one voice in the wilderness all by myself saying, I think Gabby Hanna knows what she's doing, and I don't think she's out of touch with reality. I think she's lucid while she's making these videos, and in fact, she herself claims to be lucid while making these videos. Who diagnosed me with bipolar 2 is also bipolar type 2, and she told me, why do you keep treating mania like a bad thing? Did people tell you mania was a bad thing? Because mania is just a heightened sense of energy. So I, instead of misfiring my manic energy that I was blessed with, decided to focus it into things that could actually create change. That doesn't make me a perfect person, but it makes me a lightning rod. So if I can harness the attention of major news outlets and reach the world whenever I want at my fingertips, I decided to talk about what matters. And that's what I'm going to be doing for forever. Jayeshtas are notorious for acting insane or being insane. Sometimes it's hard to tell if they're being sincere or not. Are they self-aware? Have they lost the plot? Are they performance artists? This is because the intention, the machinations behind the rabbit's behavior are only obvious to those who have eyes to see. The rabbit, after all, is a trickster. It's no wonder why rabbits are so frequently positioned as mascots of madness. Their theatrical behavior in inappropriate social contexts betrays their unnerving awareness that, despite all their superficial prestige, they are actually little more than characters in an elaborate play. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a high priest, uh, Vatican assassin, warlock. I'm hip you know what I'm saying? Come on, man. And what does that mean? I don't know. Where, all do, those, where do these words come know. from, all Charlie? All those words just sound cool <laughs> together. It comes from my, my grand wizard master. I don't know, man. I just <laughs> Stuff just comes out and it's entertaining and it's fun and it sounds different than all the other garbage people are spewing, you know? In fact, Jayeshja natives like Donald Trump are accused of being actors purposely acting crazy with an agenda to confuse the masses or to cause people to lose faith in their government. Um, there's a whole documentary I highly recommend about KFOB theater. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's about theater that is like on purpose deceptive. Um, the whole goal of this type of theater is to make people feel so immersed in the drama and the action that they are able to suspend disbelief and fully accept that what they're experiencing is real. So you can see why someone as polarizing and unpredictable as Donald Trump would be assumed to be a KFOB actor. So unsurprisingly, because of their erratic, unpredictable, polarizing behavior, some Jayeshja natives actually have their sanity openly questioned. A great example of this was Donald Trump constantly being psychoanalyzed by the press. And um, Gabby Hanna, like, I can't find the video, but Gabby Hanna actually once blew up on a live stream and was like, how do people not understand that I'm acting? This is a performance. I'm not actually crazy. It's like a character I'm playing. I don't remember her exact words, but the sentiment was people were fooled by what she thought of as just a performance of madness. And in fact, her performance was so dedicated that people still don't believe she's actually well in the mind. If you're familiar with the concept of divine insanity, that's actually what this song, The Madness of the Saints, is about. And I think the behavior of Jayeshja natives actually conveys that, like, phenomenon pretty well. There is deep medicine to be found in the rabbit's penchant for exploring the unknown, the hidden reality, the occult, and allowing that world to permanently alter its perspective and its state of being. The surrender, the commitment, and the courage that it takes to do that is impressive. Or maybe it's just stupid. Maybe the rabbit's innocence is actually naivete, and this naivete makes it overconfident in its ability to navigate strange terrain. So for our final word on the rabbit, we are going to talk about the rabbit archetype's medicine, or what you may wish to glean from this contemplation of the rabbit's symbolism. The rabbit's medicine is luck. A rabbit's foot is often carried as a lucky charm. Notice how it's the foot of the rabbit and not like the ear or the whisker or a bone or anything. 
It's the foot. Everyone knows rabbits hop. Rabbits run. Run, rabbit, run. Because they are prey animals, we may often think of the rabbit as running away from something, away from a predator, away from danger. But what we seldom acknowledge is that the rabbit may actually be running towards something. The rabbit may have a purpose, an intention behind all of its running. The rabbit is not shy, but sure-footed. For this reason, I would contend that there's nothing lucky about the rabbit's ability to survive and thrive in the world. Rather than attributing luck to the rabbit's foot, let's consider that it may actually carry a purposeful sense of drive and ambition in it. Are you worried you're going to relapse? No. Why? Because I'm not going to, period, the end. <laughs> but how do you I blinked know? And I blinked and I cured my brain, that's how. Everybody has the power just because everybody, you know, can't is the cancer of happen. Can't is the cancer of happen. I can't do it. The Nike slogan doesn't say, just try it. Oh, okay, just try it. No, just do it, man. What the rabbit teaches us is that we have all been given the gift of time. Though it may not seem like a gift, time is free. What we choose to do with it is what keeps us indebted or not to the underworld. Sure, the rabbit is safe from the wolf when she's underground. Where no one can see her, she's safe from judgmental and predatory eyes. Some would call her mad for daring to explore the overworld at all. But life is not lived underground. So when the rabbit emerges from her dark subconscious safe haven, she becomes vulnerable. Thus, she must be very careful how she uses her time when in the overworld. She must be swift in her movements. She must be conscious of her surroundings. She must be purposeful in choosing her actions. She must know who she is, where she is, what she's doing, why she's doing it, how to do it, and when to return to safety. It is only by this highly intentional and discerning application of consciousness that this vulnerable, soft little animal evades the predator and lives. The rabbit's cleverness in surviving such a harsh world is often mistaken for luck. Because how could such an unassuming, innocent little creature survive in the world by anything other than luck? But a closer look at this little trickster reveals that success has very little to do with what cards you're dealt, and a lot to do with how you play those cards, how you work your magic, how you use your power, what you intend to create in this world. The lesson in this is that it's not luck that causes some people to prosper and others to fail. It's wisdom. It's choices. It's how you use your time. So my loves, how are you using your time? Thank you for watching this video. Please go listen to my debut album, Run Rabbit Run. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Like this video and share it with your symbology loving friends. And stick around, I'm gonna be posting more awesome stuff in the near future. Love you. And now it's time for a bonus round for you Vedic astrology nerds. My best friend Mickey has a substack called Post Woke. Go follow him. He's brilliant. He posted about my album coming out on his substack, and one of his commenters said, Nice Serling reference. I had no idea what he was talking about, and then he pointed out that the cover of my album looks a lot like the imagery associated with the Twilight Zone, which Serling is the creator of. So I looked up Serling's chart. Lo and behold, he's a Jayeshta moon. What are the chances that the album cover of my album, not only am I a Jayeshta ascendant, but this album was born out of my contemplations of Jayeshta Nakshatra? And it so closely resembles the work of another Jayeshta native. Even though I knew nothing of the Twilight Zone prior to this, and it wasn't my intention to channel the Twilight Zone into my work, somebody else who knew nothing about Vedic astrology pointed out the similarities between the works of two Jayeshtas. And it is precisely these uncanny moments of resonance and synchronicity that inspire my artwork in the first place. So thank you again, my loves, for holding space for me to contemplate these things aloud. And I hope that my sharing of these insights and inspirations inspire you to create as well, because that is what the world needs now more than anything.